we've got an entire bunch of people who are just used to being digitally active and present. Now, if you do not offer them the opportunity to be digitally active and present on at work, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, will just go and be digitally active outside your tent. <laughs> just go and do it wherever they want. You've got no control. You've got no influence. This is about control. It's not about just doing a free-for-all. This is about offering a, a safe space to be able to create exactly the content that the lawyer wants to create, which is in line with exactly the brand that the law firm wants. It's, it's just really important. So, yeah, it's a, it's a hugely important pillar. We've got, and got those four pillars. We've got self-serve, frictionless creation of content. We've got governance. We've got create once, publish everywhere. And the last one is that feedback. You get those four pillars in place. It doesn't matter if you use Passel or not. If you get those four pillars in place, you, you're able to create very effective thought leadership programs. Welcome to On Record PR, where we go on record with industry leaders to discuss best practices for public relations strategies that drive business success. Let's get started with the show. Welcome to On Record PR. I'm the producer and guest host, Jennifer Simpson Carr. Today, I'm going on record with James Barclay, CEO of Passel. Passel is a software as a service company focused on providing a content marketing platform specifically for law firms. James is leading their expansion in the U.S. Alongside the co-founders of Passel, this is the third technology firm he has grown over the past 25 years. In short, James is in charge of driving digital transformation in law firms. When he is not doing that, you can find him sailing. He lives in Annapolis, Maryland. Welcome, James. Thanks very much. I'm so glad to have you today. I believe I've been 25 years. It does sound quite a long time, doesn't it? It does sound like a long time. <laughs> it also sounds like you know a lot. So <laughs> oh, well, we'll see. <laughs> I've always been good at recruiting. So uh, surround yourself in brilliant people and you look good. That's, uh, that's all number one. Exactly. So actually, a brilliant person is how we met years ago. And I think my stake and claim to fame with Passel is that I think I was one of your first demos ever in the US. You absolutely were. Yeah. In a pub on an iPad from memory. Yes. Yeah. So legal week. Quite sketchy. Something. <laughs> <laughs> Nadia Hardy from Moran. She yeah. was from the Cayman Islands. She was a friend of mine through Lowenstein Sandler. And I believe you went to- I was at university with her. Yeah. Literally sitting next to you and her. And yep. I was like, I know you. You used to have a red BMW at Kent University. <laughs> And we knew no one else. I think if I remember correctly, the three of us kind of knew each other yeah. and went to an Irish pub. Yeah. And I asked you what you did. You told me about Passel and I said, I'd love to see a demo. And I don't know if I realized it or not, but out came an iPad and I got to see like 1.0. We definitely graphed. There's no <laughs> <laughs> definitely graphed. Well, it was awesome to meet you then. And it's been great to be a friend, a colleague and a friend for so many years. And from my side, you were the first person who actually also took me under their wing. And I'm extremely grateful for that because you introduced me to all the LMA folk, introduced me to Trish Lilly, you introduced me to a whole bunch of people and that helped us set up here. Because, you know, before we moved to the States, obviously we were flying in and out and it was it's, it's quite difficult. You know, you it's just a bit awkward. No one knows who you are, no one knows what you do. And you're, you're kind of wandering around. We've, we've kind of established ourselves a bit now and, and moved over here in the last 18 months, which has made a huge difference. But thank you very much for, for looking after me, <laughs> introducing me to your friends. It's yeah, been helpful. <laughs> well, I will tell you, LMA is a big part of who I am today as a person and as a professional. And so, you know, I always love when I can open that network up to other great, smart, fun people who are, you know, we're all looking for the same thing, which is to improve the industry and, and help each other out. So yeah, and it's been an amazing community. It's extremely, an extremely helpful community to each other. It's it's quite a weird one. You know, it's not normal. As you said, I've done this, this is the third technology firm we've had. Um, Adam and Tom founded the firm and I, I come in to help them basically build them. But um, we've never worked in such a, a lovely community of people who actually support each other. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a real pleasure. It's a real it's been grand. And you said you made you mark. You have Passel as a technology platform has made a mark. But I will venture to say that those 
orange octopus have also helped make a mark in this community. Oh, a selling octopus is out of retired by now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about tech and content. I know that's why we're here today. We've been really lucky to cross paths at several really great conferences this year and have some really fun conversations around the evolution of websites, technology. So I'm excited to kind of bring that together today. So in the 25 years you've been kind of running and leading these tech firms, what have you seen is the biggest transition in website in the digital world? Digital, yeah, it's quite a big one. I suppose there's a few things. Number one, and, and this is where, where we've got to with Passel is we really just focus on on legal. We tried every, I mean, we literally tried selling Passel to everybody and every everyone in the world, and, and worked out the best people to sell Passel to was, was legal back. Then. This was years ago now. Um, so we focus very much on that. So I can kind of talk talk about that. And I suppose the thing with legal, number one, is that they're unique companies and that they're partnerships. They're owned by many people. Um, we, we think about it as distributed leadership and kind of aligns with what you do, which is this voice. You know, you, however brilliant you are at marketing a law firm, you're not the same as Coca-Cola. You know, Coca-Cola, the sales and marketing department in Coca-Cola can define exactly the messaging for Coca-Cola because it's one simple message, really. Whereas a law firm, well, a bankruptcy lawyer is extremely different to a real estate lawyer, is extremely different to an employment lawyer. And all that knowledge is essentially what they sell. And so to be able to, to display that knowledge effectively is impossible for one person in a firm or even a team of 40 people in marketing and BD in a firm. They, they can't showcase it. Well, they have, our, our perspective is you have to empower or enable those marketing and BD people to empower the lawyers themselves to in some way showcase their expertise. And I'm getting to the answer to your question, but this kind of gives you background. <laughs> the, so, so to empower that expertise, that and of course, lawyers are brilliant at doing that physically and have been forever. And so they're very used to having very flash offices, for example, bringing their clients into those flash offices, uh, paying for art, paying, you know, I've been in some lobbies where you walk into the lobby and the, the law firm who are meeting, how, you know, this, this costs $1.7 million, you know, for that lampshade. And they're very proud of that. And you're like, okay, that's that's a great lampshade. And they're doing it for a reason. They're doing it as an impact to their clients. They go into meeting rooms. And one of our law firms in the UK actually has an in, or this was at least before COVID. I'm guessing they still got them. Um, had an in-house pastry chef. I love visiting them. They had a, literally a French pastry chef. And so they understand physical influence. They they get that. Now, our attitude is that that's grand. That there's absolutely a place for that. And, it, and it's worked to treat for hundreds of years. But also this internet thing came along. And so you're not just being experienced physically, you're being experienced digitally by your clients, by your prospects, by your future colleagues. They're actually experiencing you digitally as well as physically. And so that's where you should start benchmarking that experience and, and probably that investment as well. You know, because it's like, okay, the artwork is worth, you know, twenty thousand dollars on a wall that somebody might walk past well let's have a look at your website let's have a look at your web presence let's have a look at how you're demonstrating that value let's show how you're showcasing the knowledge of your lawyers digitally because and particularly obviously i mean this came to start relief in, in covid no one went into an office absolutely nobody for two one or two years in some states and and certainly in the in europe but everyone was checking you out digitally so there's this move that's shifted and, and accelerated so that digital experience is key and so it's how do you showcase that expertise online for law firms and how how then do you, does that move? And kind of to answer your question at the end, <laughs> websites, you know, we, I first built a website in 1996 um, and it was brochureware. You know, it was IT, the IT department did it. Had a brochure of what you sold. You sent it to IT and said, can you build one of those website things, please? Put this up. And it was a brochure. And, uh, and very quickly, we were selling conferences, but very quickly we worked out that actually that it's a pretty basic thing to do. We kind of we're really missing an opportunity here. What you should be doing is talking about you know what what you do, publish and essentially publishing on a website. And so it moved from IT to marketing. So the power of the website moved from IT to to marketing, and then it moved from marketing because the salespeople in any organisation in law firms that's BD they were like, um, I think this is our space too. <laughs> like, we should have a bit of influence here. We want to talk about. The sectors we represent, the industries we represent, we want bio pages showcasing how brilliant our lawyers are and how knowledgeable they are. So marketing and BD took over the, the website. And now, of course, with this distributed leadership, well, if you've got 500 partners in a law firm, 
you've got 500 owners of that law firm who need to have ownership of that website too. And so we're seeing Brenda Plowman from the CMO at Faskin, where she said it to me, is democratizing the website. You're saying to everyone, here, have your, and, and of course with PR, have your voice. How are you going to get voice of everyone onto that website? And that's really, that's the really exciting changes that I'm seeing is this move from it being IT in the 90s to being marketing and BD to now being absolutely everyone should have a stake in it. And how do you then manage that? And how do you do it without it just turning into a complete free for all? I love the analogy you use about the physical office space versus the digital presence, because certainly, you know, rewind many years, in-person meetings, in-person pitch meetings. I mean, I remember interviewing very early on in Manhattan and being very floored by the beauty and the expense that was put into that first impression walking into the building, onto the main floor, into the lobby. And so... Right. As quickly as COVID progressed, that it was already changing and then COVID ramped it up, that same feeling in theory should really exist on your website. Right. That first impression of, wow, this is somewhere I could work. This is someone I should be working with. And of course, not just on your website, but in any digital format. Mm. You know, I mean, it's websites are a, a great place to be, but also people are experiencing your experiencing you through your emails that you send with useful you know, useful content. They're, they're experiencing you through newsletters that your firm sends, and they better be focused and useful. <laughs> they're experiencing you through through the content that's being distributed by people like Lexology, Mondak, and, and JD Supra. And so there's this digital network that's going out with it, but of course it needs that content and that useful content going out to, to represent you. I was at a conference, I can't remember which one, an LMA, I think it was in in Savannah last year. And Erin Corbin Mazaros, who's Chief Business Development and Chief Service Officer at um, Evershed Sutherland, was quoted. And what she said is, you need to be, you need to meet your clients where they are. You need to meet your clients where they are. She's absolutely spot on. So she was sort of saying, you know, sometimes that's the office, sometimes that's in their home, sometimes that's digitally. And so, but you, as as a law firm, you need to go meet them where they are rather than them ex- expecting them to always kind of come to you and find you. And I think that was, I think that's true. It's a great piece of advice and it's a great way to think about content distribution. It's what we talk about with our clients very often, which is the various types of content available and what makes sense for the firm to leverage based on where they're trying to meet their clients. Because just because a certain industry, C-level executive or CEO in a certain industry really prefers articles, there may be some industries where that same target audience prefers video or podcasts. Or, so I, I love that, that quote that you quoted, Aaron. And so, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Can you tell me more about what has changed from your perspective of that handoff from IT owning the websites and kind of the content and the presence to now marketing and BD from your perspective? Yeah, well, I think it's also moved from BD and marketing to the lawyers themselves. Hmm. I think it's about enabling the marketing and BD now need to enable and empower the lawyers and the other stakeholders. They've got all these stakeholders who who can represent them and represent them the whole time, um, enabling all of them to have an online presence. If you if I'm a lawyer, I care about my bio page. I don't really care about anything else. And they're the most visited part of the website, right? And that's my space. That's my real estate. As a lawyer, I should be in charge of it. I should be able to say, you know, what goes up there. Now, it obviously has to have a governance process. But my belief is that the lawyer should be able to put up a video, put up a podcast, put up a long form article, a short form article, whatever they want to put up, they should be able to put up whenever, however, and, and, and when, wherever they want with strict guidelines, right? <laughs> we don't want to go rogue. So there needs to be editorial yeah. guidelines, there needs to be the governance process, but that's nothing new. You know, it's a, this is a the content on law firm websites is a new. They've had they've had processes to governance. It's just they've been doing it with this with Word documents and red lines and emails and just mm-hmm. crazy antiquated systems, as far as I'm concerned, that are also deeply flawed as far as, you know, there, there's risk there. So it just needs to, you know, they can be made more efficient. When you enable those lawyers to do it, they then own their space they then own it then they're interested so 
for example, we talk to lots of BD folk and they say, oh, God, we've been trying to get our lawyers to do LinkedIn for five, ten years, <laughs> whatever it is, and they fail. And our, our perspective is it was because they don't own it. If you're just shoving stuff at them and saying, hey, share this on LinkedIn, they like, well, why? If as soon as they create something themselves, the creation process itself means that they own it, they're much more likely then to go, oh, now I get LinkedIn. It's how I talk to the 15 people who give me all my money every year. Now, 80% of billable hours comes from 15 to 20 people from most lawyers. Now, this isn't rocket science. You just have to connect to those 15 people. They're the most likely to buy more stuff from you. I know I'm simplifying it, but lawyers do sell stuff. You know, I, I know because we've got three law firms that look after us. I pay the bills. So, I mean, it's, it's not dressed it up too much. Yeah. You know what I mean? I am a client. And so they sell their knowledge. They sell what they know. And I really value it. What I don't value, and this is feedback that we've had from Linklaters, from Slaughter and May from DLA Piper, is they go to their clients, they say, hey, what do you like about us? I say, we, we think you're brilliant lawyers, you know, you're dead clever, you get us all out of all sorts of trouble, <laughs> and, you, um, and you're brilliant. What don't you like about us? Well, you cost a lot, but we get it. And you only talk to us when there's a bill attached. So often, and I'm generalizing, but often a law firm will say, hey, we are trusted advisors. Bring us into your, you know, bring us into your team. We're, we're there for you. And so they talk about being trusted advisors, but their action is transactional. Because if the only time they talk to their clients is when the bill's attached, you feel like you're in a transaction as a client. You know, that's, that's how it goes. However, if they send me a note out of the blue with something useful, then I'm like, oh my God, you know, my lawyers are written. Number one, I always open the emails from my lawyers. Like I ignore most of my emails, but my lawyers' emails are open. And everyone opens their lawyers. I mean, that's why it's so good being in BD in a law firm, because your, your emails get opened. <laughs> it's like being back in the 90s. And so, it's, so you've got this opportunity, but you've got to send something in between bills. I think I went off track again there, Jennifer. We always do. But that online presence is key. So Yeah. Let me throw this out. You know, we both have experience working in and with and, and for various size firms with various size budgets and cultures. And right, there's so many differences between the firms represented by the listeners of, of our podcast. Generally, what do you see firms doing really well to empower their lawyers to own that online presence? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the ones who are best at it are the ones who really have a few things. Number one, they have buy-in at a senior level on the legal side. So it's, it's CMOs and directors of marketing and BD who have really done the groundwork to gain the trust of the sector heads or the industry heads or the, or the CEO of the firm or the, or the managing partner. That's the number one key that they see them as, they see them internally as really trusted and they, you know, experts. If they do that, then they have the opportunity then to try stuff. They, they build up into capital within law firm. I mean, law firms are by their nature kind of, as you know, the power is in, in unequal. You know, there's, there's, I mean, there's only the industry in the world where they say lawyers and non-lawyers, which is just absolutely horrific. And, uh, you know, I, I talk about fee, and, fee earners and fee enablers. Yes. And that's incredibly important. I will interject there for a moment. We work very hard in this industry to change that narrative. And I I love the analogy, you don't say doctor or non-doctor or, you know, something similar to that. So I love that. We're entirely aligned on this one. But the ones that work, the marketing and the BD essentially have worked hard to get the trusted, you know, trusted advisor role within with with their lawyers. The next one is if you're going to try something, try it small first. Go in quick, you know, for example, in not Passel show, but with Passel, we always do a proof of value, two-month proof of value with 20 lawyers. We don't tell the lawyers who are on it, that they're on a proof of value. We tell them that they're the lucky ones who got to go first, you know, and then you build a bit of FOMO, you build a fear of missing out. Mm-hmm. And then you celebrate like crazy the success of the lawyers, especially if they're, you know, it kind of helps if they're kind of associates rather than partners. But there's nuance there. You have to work in the in the, in the environment and the power environment within a law firm to build in new, new culture and, and change culture. I think the other thing is you chase your winners. Whenever there's change within a law firm, I think Adam, who's, who's founded Passive, he said to me, the thing about our job is quite often we're walking into a room full of millionaires saying, what you need to do is change everything. <laughs> it's like, well, we've got a millionaires, you know, we're doing all right, thanks. <laughs> and so 
you do need to be careful, but if you can, if you chase the winners, the ones who really want to change, and for us, that's often digital natives. That's people are people who are on the on the upward track. It's not sometimes though, it's massively surprising. Sometimes it's you know the oldest equity partner in the place just going, yes, it's exactly what we need. Mm-hmm. But it's also aligning any anything you're doing with the goals of the strategic goals of the firm, the strategic goals of the team, and the strategic goals of the individual. It's got to make sense personally to the lawyer not because the bd person told them to or a sales or a marketing person or certainly not if i told them to but because they fundamentally understand that this will buy them a new porsche you know or or another house whatever it is they need you know they're trying to get or influence and power and most importantly we always talk about this we say look you can either be present online you can you can activate your voice and you can shape the conversation or you can let someone else do it i'm gonna be as good as you they're gonna do it there's a space there your clients are listening, but you you need to be out there having a the conversation. Otherwise, somebody else is going to rule it. And I think one of the things we talk about, you and I talk about pretty often, is that they're the expert and the, the information that we need in order to support them is in their head. Nobody else can duplicate that or replicate it. So, Oh, bloody knowledge. You know, they've, they've been through the ringer to get that knowledge and that experience. Yes. And let's pause here to hear a message from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Furia Rubel Communications. Recognized as the number one agency by the National Law Journal, Furia Rubel helps top businesses and law firms with high stakes public relations and marketing, reputation management, crisis planning, and incident response, including high profile litigation media relations. To learn more, go to furiarubel.com or email podcast at furiarubel.com. So, what trends are you seeing in the industry right now and how are they impacting your business at Passel and the advice that you're giving to clients sure well coming back to what works we're seeing a, over the last sort of eight years i've been doing this in, in legal i'm seeing a greater power allocated to marketing and bd I'm seeing cmos being far more taken far more seriously at the top table and being you know properly driving businesses within law firms um seeing that that's certainly something i'm seeing seeing people now you know cmos coos and chief growth officers are taking over seeing much more understanding that bit that law firms are businesses number one we're seeing this digital transformation as we we're talking about you know that actually i'm old now but there are obviously like if you're what 35 and younger you've always had the internet Mm-hmm. Yes, is it? It must be about that. Yes. I mean, it's terrifying. But you've always had it. So, you know, certainly somebody now who's who's a trainee or an associate, they're total digital digital natives. So if you're not providing them an, an online safe space for them to operate within your tent, they will be operating digitally. They just won't be doing it in your tent, they'll be doing it somewhere else. So so that we're seeing. We're seeing for us a lot of many of our clients, the expectation on BD and marketing teams is enormous. I don't know if that's changed, but it just seems like there is so much pressure on the people we work with, you know, in the, in the media market. And, and some of their teams are not very big. And so one of the things that we identified very early was you can't just deliver technology. You have to deliver people with it. You can't just say, oh, here's a magic bullet. That'll work because it doesn't. And the technology rarely works like that. Some, sometimes it does. But with us, it's all about client success team for us. Probably the thing I'm most proud of at Paso is, yeah, the value of what we sell is the technology is awesome. We're working on, we just developed some AI stuff. It's phenomenal. We've got some really ridiculously clever people. Brilliant. Without the client success team coming in, having weekly meetings. And like, I mean, I, Reed Smith or a client of ours, I've had a weekly, I had a weekly meeting with them for three years and then it moved to monthly and I still meet them, you know, and, and it means that we know what they're doing they know what we're doing but that's crucial and i think i think from a vendor side we start there's more of an understanding of that you can't just go to a already overstretched marketing and bd team and say hey here's another thing you got to go in with here's a thing that's going to help make your life easier more efficient and by the way we're bringing in people who can share best practice and expertise yeah as somebody who sat in that that seat for a decade i always appreciated when service partners we're very engaged in the process and really understood the challenges we were facing. And, and now on this side, I'm very sensitive to it. We don't want to be adding to their plate. We want to be supporting them, making them shine, helping them succeed in their roles with their attorneys. But no, I was just thinking, it's also, I think, just ridiculously important for us as service providers, digital service providers, that we all work together, that we all integrate and that we link our efforts together and we talk we talk away from our clients 
so that when we go to them, it's all aligned. So, for example, you know, with you guys, it's like, okay, these are our campaigns. We're trying to make ESG a big deal within a law firm, or you know, or, or DEI is really important, but they're not getting the message across. Well, then we have a chat behind the scenes so that we can go in, you know, with with your plan, but also with our tech and our client success all aligned, so that for the law firm, they're not having to join the dots. I think they, someone someone said to me, um, Craig Budner at uh, KNL Gates, he was saying the trouble with vendors is we've got this bloody great house and you're all chucking the furniture in, but it's not organized. Mm-hmm. So I'm walking in and it's chaos. And I need to work out where all the furniture sits. And it's like, can you just sort the furniture out for me? <laughs> and, so, and I think that's it. We can all sit there and align. We've integrated with, with Mondat, with Lexology, with um, JD Supra. We're working with the CRMs. We work with all the PR, you know, with you guys, with other PR firms, so that we're all sitting there together. And I think that's, where, again, come back to the LMA, that's where that's extraordinarily useful. But we all have those links. Yeah, absolutely. That's something I learned very quickly from Gina is the value of collaborating with other service partners and other service partners of our clients, just as you said. And that's a great analogy. I love the furniture analogy in a house, but I mean, it's so true. We're all there to, again, same goal, make the client look good, help lift the marketing and BD team. And so that collaboration is, it really can be critically important. And I think, I mean, particularly for technology, mm-hmm. you know, technology providers, it's so that we're, we're sitting there and are kind of with our view of the world, but unless we can see where we fit with everybody else, how can, you know, somebody in marketing who's already got a billion and other things to do, sit there and go, okay, now I've got to build a stack and build this jigsaw. It's like, we should at least go in with the jigsaw ready, you know? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So what trends are you seeing specific to websites and how law firms are approaching website development? It's a bit tacky, but I think it's important. Traditionally, we've seen law firms kind of build a website and then burn it down after seven years and then build another one and then burn it down. And then burn. so you kind of build this thing that deteriorates over seven years. You go, oh, no, it's rubbish. I hate my website. You burn it down, you build it. And these are, for CMOs and marketing, they are career-defining moments. I have, we know people who have been fired for screwing up the website. So it's it's stressful. And so... What we're seeing is a shift in the way that happens. And we, we you can look at how, how other industries have attacked this. And, and obviously, we look at e-commerce. We look at how Amazon did it and, and e-commerce sites and shops. And the, the lesson we've learned from them is actually you can build websites. They call them composable. But essentially, you, you put the foundation blocks in place. And then you build a thin website on top. And so And all those foundations can talk to each other. And thin website on top can be changed at any moment. And so for using Passel as an example, you know, we open up content creation and distribution and feedback to absolutely every stakeholder in the law firm. So we can sit alongside, for example, a WordPress or a Sitecore or an Umbraco or whatever you use. And if we've got APIs that sit with, with that site, it means that rather than four people having access to Sitecore, you've got every some person in the law firm be able to create content wherever they like in a safe environment because you've got governance with the distribution because we've linked in with Mondak and JD Super and Nexology and on CRMs and everything else. But it all goes through what they've already got, which is their site core or their or their, their WordPress. What that means is that if rather than burning down the website every seven years, you've already got all those building blocks in place. You just have to change it from blue to black to pink. So you build a thin website on top. And of course that just makes everything far more flexible and far more manageable and far more and you don't ever burn it down. You just change bits, and you add bits, and it becomes all a, a work in progress the whole time. And with e-commerce sites, they did that, you know, originally, and this was back in, I guess, the early 2000s. Everyone who thought they would build a shop online would build the entire database. They'd put the cart in there. They'd put the payment system. They'd build a whole thing. It was a right pain because as soon as they wanted to change something, they had to talk to an agency and change it. And, then, and of course, Shopify came along. And they went, you build, you build the thing that looks pretty at the front. And we'll do all that work behind. No one will know it's, we're there, but we'll do all the work. So Shopify did fantastically for because of that. And that's composable. Does, does that make sense? We're seeing that shift. Yeah. And it sounds like it's it's not only the things you mentioned, but more efficient and more cost effective. Far more efficient, far low risk. And of course, taking Passel as a block. Mm-hmm. If you don't like Passel, you get rid of it and bring in another block. You know, the replacement of the Passel block. But it doesn't mean your website falls over or you need to rebuild it or you need to change your agency. You know, so all these different parts are interchangeable. So tell me about the governance process. 
And it raises a question for me because we work with law firms who are typically risk adverse. And so we're talking about giving attorneys who have different perspectives and backgrounds and life experiences, giving them the power to create their own content and own their own presence. Tell me about the governing process. You have to have it. <laughs> you do not want a slightly angry attorney at like nine o'clock on a Friday night after a bottle of a bottle of Beaujolais. So yeah, obviously, this, as I said before, this is not new, and it just has to have. You have to have approval processes in. Now, traditionally, that's been done with word documents and red lines and lots of things, emails being sent around, and it can be chaotic. Frankly, you can replicate that within Passel, but we just try to streamline it so that there's. You know, for different types of content, there can be different types of governance. So if it needs four eyes, you know, four people looking at it, then it can have four people. If it needs one person looking at it, it would be one person. If the first person who looks at it goes, oh, this needs a client, this might mention a client, so conflicts might come in, then that can get escalated over there. But it all sits on one set of railings with one audit process and, of course, complete control. Because at any moment, those people can go in and edit it. They can take it down. They can change it. And mm-hmm. so you can also react. So it's not just, it's not a Word document created here when kind of round 15 people you didn't know and turned up on a website three weeks later that you have no idea how to control. You're able to, by that process to see the entire audit trail, to see any changes, to be able to go backwards and forwards and create exactly what is appropriate. But importantly, and this is where me and you work together, mm-hmm. the very start of it is to make sure the lawyers know what to say and what not to say. The nice thing about lawyers is they like rails. You can give them the rails, but you just need to be clear on that. And of course, that fits with exactly, you know, the advice that you can provide. Yeah. And that's an area. And and yeah, I appreciate you saying that. It's an area that we, you know, that we get a lot of questions about. And we always advise our clients to have some type of content creation policy and not just put them on an intranet where you hope people read them, but educate your attorneys and staff, train them on what that means. And then it sounds like with your technology, you can actually implement that in a way that it's a process. Yeah, no, it makes it far safer. Yeah. And of course, they've got to think of the alternative. So if you don't, <laughs> this is what I keep saying, we've got an entire bunch of people who are just used to being digitally active and present. Now, if you do not offer them the opportunity to be digitally active and present on at work, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, will just go and be digitally active outside your tent. I'll just go and do it wherever they want. You've got no control. You've got no influence. You know, this is about control. It's not about just doing a free-for-all. This is about offering a, a safe space to be able to create exactly the content that the lawyer wants to create, which is in line with exactly the brand that the law firm wants. That's just really important. So, yeah, it's a, it's a hugely important pillar. We've going got those four pillars. We've got self-serve, frictionless creation of content. We've got governance. We've got create once published everywhere. And the last one is that feedback. You get those four pillars in place. It doesn't matter if you use Passel or not. You get those four pillars in place, you, you're able to create very effective thought leadership programs. So tell me more about those four pillars. Okay. So so the first one is from a marketers and, and uh, BD perspective is self-service, effortless publication. Just lawyers are so busy. There's so much pressure on them. That to be to do anything, you have to get rid of every single hurdle, any little bump, they will fall over, and they'll do something else. So you just so the technology what we built makes it really really easy for them to do it. Number one, so just make it dead easy, and make it so that you can say yes all the time. I want to create a podcast, yes. I want to do a video, yes. I want to link to a YouTube video, yes. You know, all these things you can just do. So number one, say yes to it. You know, make it effortless. Right? Not yes to everything, but. Yes. They feel empowered. The, the point is they're empowered. That it's no longer a thing they're not empowered. Power is important for them. Mm-hmm. Um, ownership's important. So number one, self-service, effortless publication. Number two, governance, what we talked about. Make, yes. sure, make sure it's in place. Make sure it's robust. Make sure it's auditable. Make sure it's really simple to do and that you can set in whatever governance you need you can achieve. Number three is create once, publish everywhere. We don't talk to the lawyers about this, but essentially what the lawyer's done when they've created a piece of content and quite often the content that's created on Passel is three or 400 words, right? They, they've got so much, in, you know, if they can get that out of their heads and onto on digitally quickly and easily, you've got this, essentially you've got a digital asset. You've got something that can be sweated. It can be something that can be used. And, and you can obviously get the lawyer to share that on their own LinkedIn via email, but also the firm can then use that as well. So great for cross-sell. 
And I think you're you're referencing COPE. So we actually, we advise clients on create once, publish enthusiastically and strategically. Oh, I love it. Okay. A little bit of a spin, but it's really how you distribute the content going back to the quote you mentioned from Aaron, where your where your target audience is. That is exactly. So COPE. That's exactly it. So, yep. so once you've done that, and of course, that's where also you link it, make the technology link together. So that's where Lexology, Monday, Chaney Supra. And this comes into the last bit because those met newsletters, we know where that content went and where it was read. And so what we've done is then link with those distributors, the, the newsletters, the, the content distributors, and we've taken their data back into PASL and deliver it back to the lawyer. And that's really, we also deliver it aggregated to marketing and everyone else, but getting it to the lawyer themselves is the key because they've created something. Within a couple of hours, usually it's been approved. That's important speed. Couple of hours, and it's up online. So they're like, wow, I did that two hours ago and it's up there. Brilliant. It then gets distributed by these things they've they don't really know about, you know, they don't care. What they really care about is one of those 15 people that they that give them 80% of their billable hours a year read it. So Bob from Facebook or Sharon from Shell or whoever, they get then told that they interacted with that content, they've read it, and they're like, oh wow, that's great. I'll do that again. So that feedback is the last pillar. Is that you tell the lawyer who read it, who saw it, who interacted with it. It's such an important step. And I, I know I think all four of those are brilliant. And obviously the governance is critically important, you know, for so many reasons, but that feedback or that analytics process, it, it is so difficult in PR and in content oftentimes to put a dollar value on the return. And so having demonstrating the success in ways like here's your target audience and here are the specific people that read it really does go a long way in ensuring that they come back to, they meaning the lawyers come back to participate. Well, that's right. And the other, the other way, of course, you know, the killer app of the internet is still the email. <laughs> you know, forget it, but you know, the internet, the email is incredibly useful. And so we, we have a tool called, and you know, this is the toy, which is, I saw this and thought of you. It's an email with a link in, but we've just dressed it up. So lawyers don't think they're selling something. They just think they're being helpful, which is what selling is, of course. Mm. So they send a client, they wrote a post or they've got a post by one of their, their colleagues and they send it to a client saying, I saw this post and I thought of you, it's the toy. Now, the number of times we have had feedback from lawyers going, oh, I used this to toy and I got a piece of business as if it's magic. It's like, yeah, you know, you were in, you were contacting your client between bills between invoices mm -hmm. they open the email because you're their lawyer and you send something useful that they didn't ask for it's going to put you in a pretty good step those people those those 15 to 20 people who are, ready, who are, percent, who are responsible for 80 percent of your billable hours they're the most likely people to buy more from you and they're the most likely people to refer and recommend you it's really funny that you say that because i worked very closely with a practice group years ago and they were very resistant to, or hesitant, I should say hesitant to using LinkedIn. And I remember we had a very low risk campaign. And the first time we distributed it, we got a piece of new business. Yeah. And my phone was ringing off the hook and I was getting emails. How do I use this LinkedIn? And, yeah. and, what do I do? and so it's so nice when that happens. And it's a testament to like the training that we give and the work that we do. And so it was just funny to hear that that success story. The last thing, I promise this is the last thing. Last thing I think is really, really important. And fortunately, a greater trend within law firms is, is about voice, is about empowering voice and empowering voice across your organization. You know, and I think you can also use this very much in line with your DE&I initiatives and that you should. You know that actually you should be giving you need to showcase the firm you want to be is, is what i always say to people so you and i could have conversations around strategy and we could talk for days offer right? yes <laughs> we have we have talked for days in a row <laughs> and i don't want to i don't want our listeners to have to experience that but what i will leave our listeners with is that compared to traditional marketing efforts i just read this stat Content marketing costs 62% less and generates three times as many leads. And so if you need data, or as Gina calls it uh, for the lawyers, evidence as to why content creation, content distribution, and the time around marketing is so valuable, that data point is it. So, yeah. and, and your general counsels, your clients, 
they want this information from you and, and they'll judge you on it. Absolutely. So thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure as always to chat with you. It was nice to do it in a more formal way today, virtually. Thank you very much. Before I let you go, where can our listeners get in touch if they want to follow up with you or learn more about Passel? Find me on LinkedIn or james at passel.net. Awesome. Thank you again. Great stuff. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to On Record PR. Visit our website, onrecordpr.com, to subscribe to the show, share it with your friends on social media, find show notes, additional episodes, and more information. We'll see you next time. In the meantime, feel free to send us questions or show ideas at podcast at onrecordpr.com.